Please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> there are times when we hear or see things take place in the world that affect us and they appeal to our emotions and we might say that is touching. Saw a news story where a child had taken the time to, I'm sure with some adult help and supervision, make opportunity to get a community to donate blankets for those who didn't have what they needed to be warm. Those who maybe couldn't afford blankets or maybe those who didn't have homes. We might look at that and say that was touching. <clears throat> when events take place around the world, terrorism, things of that nature, and after those events we see people come together of all different colors and nationalities and races and, and they stand together and they condemn such and they stand together as a people who want to live in peace and we say that's touching. And just recently the NFL had a football game in Mexico City and there was all sorts of debate up uh, prior to the game. It was shortly after our elections here, our presidential elections, and the talk was are they going to boo our national anthem? Are they going to make some sort of protest during our national anthem? And during our national anthem, there was a nice calm and peace, and they cheered after our national anthem was played, and I thought that was touching. And these things that we refer to as touching, they appeal to our emotions and our feelings, but they also appeal to our intellect, our mind. We think back to that child, and we think we ought to have such a heart that thinks about others, that wants to make sure that people have warmth during the cold winter months, and we think in our minds we ought to be able to do good deeds that have large impacts. They may be small uh, as it pertains to the whole world, but uh, small good deeds can impact large, largely in our communities. And we think to that child and we think we ought to have such a humble and honest and desire in our heart to, to be like that child. And we think of the nations that stand together and we think, well, there are bad people in this world and there are evil people in this world, but there are people in this world that have common goals. They want to live in, a, in peace and they want to, to work together and it gives us hope in our minds that maybe we can work together for a better world and a peaceful world. And it reminds us that red, yellow, black, or white, they're all precious in Jesus' sight as we sing in the song, that it doesn't matter our race, uh, our nationality, it doesn't matter the color of our skin, that we're all seen as the same in God's sight, and God sees us as a soul that we ought to be uh, searching to help and to save and to bring to Christ. And so all those things are touching, and they appeal to our emotions and our feelings, but they also appeal to our mind and our intellect. And in Mark chapter 5, we read of a couple of touching events. Both involved Jesus and the miraculous. And we're going to look at these miraculous events, these miraculous touchings, but we're going to make application to our uh, our ourselves today is how we can look at that and how that can apply to our lives today though today the miracles have ceased because the reason and the purpose behind them to fulfill to confirm the word has already taken place and so we begin in mark chapter 5 verse 25 and we'll read of the first touching event uh, down through verse about 34 the bible says a certain woman who had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things, uh, many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather got worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. 
And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and says, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. This woman had an issue that had caused her much pain. She had suffered greatly. She had suffered since she was 12 years old. She had gone to doctors, and it seems that the doctors did more harm than good. That, according to the passage, may have even mistreated the woman. She had used all of her financial means to take care of this problem, and nothing had uh, got her the peace that she wanted. And so she heard about Jesus. And she heard of this man, and what she heard of this man obviously was that he could heal, right? That he had the power to heal, and that he uh, obviously had to have been from God in order for this to take place. And she didn't want anything special. She didn't want a special meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jesus. She said in her mind, if this man is from God, if this man who is who he says he is, if the, if the information about this man is true, I simply need to touch his garment and I'll be, made, he, I'll be made whole. She was convinced based upon the fact that if he is from God, this is the power of God and this is what will take place. She fought her way through the press, the press being a multitude of people, a large gathering of people, so much so that when Jesus said, who touched me, the disciples looked around and said, are you kidding? Look how many people are around here. It could have been any number of these thousands of people, right? So there were so many people there that she had to work, she had to fight her way to get to Jesus, didn't she? And that must have been a hard, difficult time. She was already in pain, she was already suffering. But she had determined in her mind, I'm going to go and touch Jesus. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to the, the one who can take care of me. He alone has what I need, and I'm going to get to him one way or another. If it means that I have to fight through the multitude, fight through the press, if it means that I have to cause myself more harm or pain or suffering, I'm going to get through it. And she did. And she could have seen the multitude and said, there's no hope. Right? She could have seen the multitude and said, it's not worth it. She could have seen the obstacles in her way and said, there, I just, I'm never going to get there. But she didn't, did she? She saw Jesus, she wanted to get to Jesus, and she did get to Jesus. She wasn't going to let anything stop her from getting to Jesus. When she got to Jesus, she touched him, and she realized that what had been said about Jesus was right. The Bible tells us that immediately she felt better. She didn't have to wait a day or two, she didn't have to wait a week, she didn't have to wait a month. She was healed immediately, perfectly whole. Never felt that way before, or so she, or at least since she was twelve. And so she knew that a miracle had taken place. And at that point, she could have said, "Woohoo, it's over, right?" But that's not what she did, is it? She, because she appreciated what had taken place fought her way back through the crowd. <laughs> she was going to say thank you to the Lord. And Jesus saw her and obviously had compassion upon her. And he reassured this woman. <clears throat> Verse 34, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Yes, a miracle had taken place. That miracle was needed Jesus in order for it to happen, but who did Jesus give the credit to? He said that woman's faith made her whole. Now some might look at this and say, well, this woman, she was saved by faith, right? All she needed was faith. No, she needed a whole lot more than faith. 
Faith, she could have stayed at home. You know, if it was faith alone, right? This woman needed a whole lot more than faith. She needed faith and she said, I'm going to touch him. I'm going to touch that garment. And she could have stayed at home if it was by faith alone, right? If she didn't need to touch that garment, if she didn't need to come to Jesus in any way, she could have stayed at home. She knew staying at home would be, I'm going to stay exactly the way I am. The only way I'm going to be better, the only way I'm going to be healed of this problem is to get to Jesus. I know where Jesus is. I'm going to go touch him. When she got there, she fought through the crowd. She, you know, if she, Why fight through the crowd if all that she needed to do was believe that Jesus could do it, right? This woman did a whole lot more than believing. She believed it could take place, and because she believed it, she did everything necessary to touch Jesus. <clears throat> and because of that, her faith made her whole, right? Her faith was not a dead faith. It was a living, active faith. It was a faith that said, I believe Jesus will do it, and I'm going to go make sure that it gets done. It wasn't just because she knew Jesus could heal. It wasn't just because she was willing to go do it. It was because she knew it and did it. <laughs> she put all those things together. Now, are we willing to go that extent to get to Jesus? No, we can't physically touch Jesus or his garments today. Nor does the Lord require us to do that, right? That's not what God asks us to do. <clears throat> but we do have to come close to Jesus. We have to come into contact with Jesus somehow, don't we? We recognize that we have a disease, a disease of a spiritual nature. It's sin. It's separated us from God. It's, it's caused a rift, a division between us and our God. And the only way to be reconciled back to God is to come to Jesus, to come to the Lord. And we can't come to Him physically. The only way to come to Him then is spiritually. So how do we come to Jesus spiritually today? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through verse 30, Jesus says, come unto me. Well, He doesn't, say, he doesn't mean build a ladder to heaven, does He? There were some people that tried to do that in the Old Testament. He's not talking physically here, is he? He's talking spiritually. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. How do we come to Jesus today? We learn about Jesus. We don't learn about who he was. We don't learn just about who he was or what he did. But we learn what he taught. And what are the consequences of not doing what he said and the, and the rewards of doing what he said? Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have sheep. I'm the great shepherd. You want to know who my sheep are? Verse 27, My sheep are they who hear my voice and follow me. You want to come to Jesus? Come to him, right? How do we come to Him? We have to hear His Word. We have to learn from Him. And we need to follow Him. Not just hear and, and learn, but follow. Do. right? Not just be hearers, but doers. James chapter 1, verse 22. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. The Bible speaks of the closest spiritual relationship that we can have. How we can touch Jesus. In Romans chapter 6 verse 3, the inspired writer says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. How do we touch Jesus today? Well, we have to hear His voice. We have to learn of Him, learn from Him, and then we have to follow Him. And the Bible tells us that we have to be baptized into Him. Now there's no closer relation than being in. Right? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death that like as Christ was 
raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice the relationship here. We're in Christ. We've been planted together. We've been buried together. We've been raised together. We walk together. And so to touch Christ today, we have to hear His Word, follow it, and the culminating act of obedience to touch Jesus tells us here is baptism. Water baptism. Where the Lord applies the blood that He shed on the cross that washes away sin, Revelation 1 verse 5. That woman touched Jesus. She didn't let anything get in her way from touching Jesus because she knew she could be healed. Today, if you have sin in your life, if you have not yet obeyed the gospel, then you have a spiritual disease. And that sin, the only way to take care of it is to come to Jesus. And if you read the words of Christ and you follow them, it leads you to water baptism. And if you'll be baptized into Christ, you'll be touching Jesus. And the Lord will wash you whole. You'll be made clean just like that woman was clean. Why? Because your faith will make you whole. That woman's faith led her to being whole. And your faith can lead you to being whole today. Washed, clean. You don't have to worry about your sins anymore. Your past sins. They're all gone. They're washed away. And so we can touch Jesus, not physically, but spiritually speaking. Paul talked of his sins being washed away. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Not being held accountable for those anymore because they had been remitted. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. And so today, if we touch Jesus, spiritually speaking, we can be made whole just like that woman was made whole by her faith. But in Mark chapter 5, we also see another touching event. <clears throat> Here, it is Jesus who does the touching. <laughs> Mark chapter 5, verse 35. <clears throat> While Jesus yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogues, how certain who said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, but believe. And he suffered no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Wait, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him. And he entered in where the damsel was lying, and he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talithikima, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. On the way to the house, Jairus, as we know in other parallel accounts was told that his daughter was dead Jesus reassured him that he needed to have faith he needed to believe and he only allowed three of his closest disciples to follow with him Jesus or uh, Peter James and John and they come to the house of Jairus and there was a great tumult there wasn't there People wailing, weeping, just as we would when we lose a loved one. And Jesus told them not to weep. He told them not to wail. They ridiculed Jesus. He told them something that they didn't understand, didn't he? Something that people still today don't understand. He said, the damsel is merely asleep now we know that she wasn't asleep in the sense that she was going to wake up of her own means 
she was dead. Right? Luke's parallel account tells us that her spirit had gone from her, and when Jesus raised her from the dead, her spirit returned. So there was a separation of spirit and body here. She was dead. They all knew she was dead. That's why they were crying. And so when Jesus came and said, don't worry, she's only sleeping, they ridiculed him because they knew better, physically speaking, but they didn't understand what he was really trying to say. He was going to raise her from the dead for a moment. We don't know how long she was raised from the dead. She was raised from the dead long enough to eat something, right? But we don't know how long she remained alive. She probably thought, I want to go back. <laughs> My spirit had gone to a place of eternal rest. I want to go back. And we don't know what that conversation would have been like, but I'm assured, I'm assured that it would have been something to behold. Wasn't it? But she is raised from the dead for a moment, for as long as that takes place, that Jesus allowed. Because Jesus took her hand. Verse 41, he took the damsel by the hand and he said, arise. This is obviously a miraculous event just like the one we just read about a moment ago and miraculous events don't take place today. Nor is Jesus here physically to touch us physically. But there is much more to Jesus touching this damsel, this little girl, than just what we, read, what we read here. He was allowing the people to know that, yes, she was dead, but that death was not the end. That in a sense, death is a sleep. It's a, there is an awakening. There is a leaving of this earth, but an entering into another world, an eternity. And for this innocent 12-year-old and for the faithful of God, that waking is a good waking. It's morning again. Where God is the light, there's no need for a sun or a moon. There's always light. There's no tears, there's no pain, there's no sorrow. And by raising this little girl, Jesus said, death's not the end. And not only that, he was saying, I'm powerful to overcome death. And just as this girl was raised, when you die, you will be raised. You won't be raised physically, but you'll be raised, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in the twinkling of an eye, have a physical change to a spiritual change, a spiritual body that will be allowed to go into the spiritual world. It was a moment to give hope to those who had lost loved ones that they're not just gone, right? That we can be resurrected to see them again. And this takes place with Jesus making a touch. Now, as I pointed out just a moment ago, we can't touch Jesus literally or physically, and he's not here physically or literally to touch us. But he can give us the power to be resurrected, to awaken, doesn't he? He has the power to wake us from our sleep. He has the power to give us the hope of a resurrection to eternal life, doesn't he? And he does that by touching us, not physically or literally, but through a spiritual means. <clears throat> Jesus touches us today in many different ways. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, and I'll just give a few examples. When Jesus was about to be taken, led away off that mount after he had prayed to his ultimate murder, the Bible tells us that Peter cut off the ear of one of the servants. 
And Jesus rebuked him, verse 52, and said, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Now here's the man that had just, just by someone touching the hem of his garment, had been healed. Okay. <laughs> and here's someone who just by touching the hand of a daughter, raised her from the dead. And he's saying, don't you know that if I wanted to, I don't need a sword. <laughs> I can put an end to this right now. I can call 12 legions of angels, and they'll put an end to this all right now. Don't you think I can do that? But then he says this, verse 54, but how then should the scripture be fulfilled? That thus it must be. Now, that's touching. <laughs> Jesus had the power to stop this whole thing. But because of you and me and his love for us, he said, I'm going to fulfill the scripture. My blood will be shed on that cross. My blood will run from my side. And that blood will give hope to everybody in the world. Now, if that's not touching, I don't know what is. That's touching. In John chapter 13, John chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 13, Jesus says, You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, and that was just what had taken place previously. He had washed his disciples' feet. He said, I am your Master, and if I have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now this obviously was a uh, first century tradition, basically uh, one of expressing hospitality. They didn't have nice leather Nike shoes or things of that nature. Most of the time they wore some sort of rough sandal or if anything at all, right? So when they came into the house, they had walked in these uh, uh, hard shoes and dust and sand all over their feet to, uh, to offer someone uh, a water bath for their feet was to welcome them in your home and to wash their feet and to, you know, to make them feel comfortable, right? To make them feel comfortable. Today we might say, come on in and have a seat. Would you like something to drink, right? Something cold to drink. You may have walked for... Uh, an hour in the hot sun. Let me give you something cold to drink. Or if you're in the winter time, let me give you some hot chocolate, right? This was a way to show hospitality. It was a way to serve other beings. And so Jesus said, I'm your master. I'm the highest there is. And if I'm willing to get on my knees and wash your feet to bring you to, bring you to me, then what does that say you ought to do to one another? Verse 15, he says, For I have given you an example. Now, how does Jesus touch us today? Does he not touch us through his examples? <laughs> he touched us by his love that he gave his own self to sacrifice himself. He could have called those angels and ended it, but he said, No, I'm going to fulfill the, the word of God. He, he touches us with his love. He touches us with his example. Here's how you ought to live. Live like I lived. Right? So he touches us. And of course, we know all these things through the Word. That's, how we, that's the only way we know it. So we're touched by the Word. And yes, it touches us emotionally, but not just emotionally, does it? It touches us in the mind, in the intellect. It makes us think, doesn't it? It's not just about feelings and emotions. It's about the mental ac uh, acumen. It's about the intellect. And so when we're touched in the mind, we think we ought to act like Jesus. If we want to be like Jesus, we have to act like Jesus. And there is a reward for this touching, right? There is a reward for this touching. All spiritual blessings, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. All spiritual blessings to those who are in Christ. We read in Romans chapter 6 how that, yes, to contact Jesus, to touch Jesus, there must be a spiritual burial, that we're buried together with Him. But what did it say in the next verse? A resurrection, that we would be resurrected with Him. 
Just like that girl was resurrected, we can be resurrected to have newness of life in this world, but also to have the hope of an eternal life, right? That at the end of this life, if we die in this present life, we'll be resurrected. If we're still alive when Jesus returns, our body will be changed then. But we've been, we can be touched by Jesus through baptism, through His example, through love. And then, of course, that bodily resurrection in the end. Those are the results of letting Jesus touch us. And that touching comes by means of His love, by means of example, by means of obedience to His Word, for instance, being baptized so that we can be resurrected with Him. <clears throat> now, these are touching events. The ones we read about in the Bible were miraculous touches. The way we look at it today by application is by spiritual means. But we can have the same joy that woman did when she touched Jesus and she was made whole. And we can have the same joy that the parents and the family of that child had when their daughter was raised, resurrected. If we're just willing to go touch Jesus, come to Jesus on His terms, obey the Lord. If, we're allow, if we will allow through His Word and His example and His love to touch us so that we move and act, all those blessings will be ours to share. Isn't that touching? Well, this morning, if you've not yet enjoyed the blessings of being in Christ, the invitation is opened to you. Based upon what you've heard in the Scripture, believe it. Allow that faith to lead you to repent of your past Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world, and be immersed in water to have your past sins washed away. From that point on, be faithful to the Lord, and the Lord will save you in the end. If you've already obeyed those initial acts, but have separated yourself from God again, God wants you to come back to Him. God wants you to enjoy those spiritual blessings and the hope of eternal life again. Put away that thing which separates you from God. If it's private nature, take care of it privately. If it's publicly, then we can, we can be here to assist you if, if you need that. Do whatever it takes to receive that joy that comes from coming to Jesus and receiving the spiritual blessings that only He can give as we stand and sing.